Skinner's Theory of Behaviorism Bervis Frederick Skinner, famously known as B.F. Skinner, was a leading American psychologist, Harvard professor and proponent of the behaviorist theory of learning in which learning is viewed as a process of conditioning in an environment of stimulus, reward, and punishment. Skinner explains the difference between informal learning, which occurs naturally, and formal education, which depends on the teacher creating optimal patterns of stimulus and response, that is, reward and punishment. This model of behaviorist learning theory is famously known as operant conditioning. This was Skinner's model of behaviorist learning theory. But it must be noted that Skinner's views were slightly less extreme than those of Watson. In fact, Skinner believed that we do have such a thing as a mind, but that it is simply more productive to study observable behavior rather than internal mental events. Skinner's Operant Conditioning The work of Skinner was rooted in a view that classical conditioning was far too simplistic to be a complete explanation of complex human behavior. He believed that the best way to understand behavior is to look at the causes of an action and its consequences. Again, he called this approach operant conditioning. At the core of Skinner's operant conditioning is the view that behavior that is followed by pleasant consequences is likely to be repeated, while behavior followed by unpleasant consequences is less likely to be repeated. It must be noted, however, that this view was based on Edward Thorndike's law of effect. Skinner introduced a new term into the law of effect, that is, reinforcement. So that, for Skinner, a behavior which is reinforced tends to be repeated, that is, strengthened, while behavior which is not reinforced tends to die out or be extinguished, that is, weakened. These young people are studying in a new way. Class in spelling, it might as well be arithmetic or algebra or grammar or in fact anything involving the use of words or symbols. Each student is using a teaching machine, a device which creates vastly improved conditions for effective study. What are teaching machines? How are they used? What can they teach? Who prepares the material they teach? And how does this material differ from textbooks, lectures, and educational television? What impact will machine teaching have on school organization? Some of these questions can be answered in at least a preliminary way. I am B.F. Skinner, professor of psychology at Harvard University. I should like to discuss some of the reasons why studying with the help of a teaching machine is often dramatically effective. With the machine you have just seen in use, the student sees a bit of text or other printed material in a window. This may be a sentence or two or an equation in arithmetic. Some small part is missing and the student must supply it by writing on an exposed strip of paper. His response may be the answer to a question or the solution of a problem, but generally it is simply a symbol or word which completes the material he has just read. As soon as the student has written his response, he operates the machine and learns immediately whether he is right or wrong. This is a great improvement over the system in which papers are corrected by a teacher where the student must wait perhaps till another day to learn whether or not what he has written is right. Such immediate knowledge has two principal effects. It leads most rapidly to the formation of correct behavior. The student quickly learns to be right. But there is also a motivating effect. The student is free of uncertainty or anxiety about his success or failure. His work is pleasurable. He does not have to force himself to study. 
A classroom in which machines are being used is usually the scene of intense concentration. One function of a teaching machine then is to give the student a quick report on the adequacy of his response. This is important not only for efficient learning, it generates a high level of interest and enthusiasm. Another important advantage is that the student is free to move at his own pace. With techniques in which a whole class is forced to move forward together, the bright student wastes time, wasting, waiting for others to catch up. And the slow student, who may not be inferior in any other respect, is forced to go too fast. Not quite completing one day's assignment, he is even less likely to complete a second. And he gets farther and farther behind, and often gives up altogether, unless remedial steps are taken. A student who is learning by machine moves at the rate which is most effective for him. The fast student covers a course in a short time, but the slower student, by giving more time to the subject, can cover the same ground. Both learn the material thoroughly. A third feature of machine teaching is that each student follows a carefully constructed program, leading from the initial stage where he is wholly unfamiliar with the subject to a final stage in which he is competent. He does this by taking a large number of very small steps arranged in a coherent order. Each step is so small that he is almost certain to take it correctly. The material is designed to give the student as much help as possible. He is not in any sense being tested. Instead, helpful hints, suggestions, and prompts maximize the chances that he will be right. The fact that each step is very small is important. Even though it may not seem like much of an accomplishment, it is always progress in the right direction. Programs have been constructed in which without any prior study, the average student is right 95% of the time. This result is partly due to the fact that the student only moves on when he has completely mastered all the preceding material. If he is absent, he does not miss any work because he takes, off, uh, takes up where he left off upon returning to the machine. A conservative estimate seems to be that with these machines, the average grade or high school student can cover about twice as much material with the same amount of time and effort as with traditional classroom techniques. There is no magic about this. A teaching machine is simply a convenient way of bringing the student into contact with the man who writes the program. It is the, the author of the program, not the machines, who teaches. He stands in the same position as a textbook writer, except that he is much closer to the student. He and the student are constantly interacting. This interaction can be mediated in different ways, of course, and each way means a different kind of teaching machine, each having special features and advantages. Here is Dr. Arthur Lumsdane of the University of California in Los Angeles, who will discuss several possibilities with you.